I just was getting this impression, this image of just love wrapping all around the planet, all around the world. And so it is an absolute honor to be here with all of you today to talk about miracle inspired practices for untangling the anxious mind. Now, first of all, I do ask that you have a pen and paper handy. If you can get that, if you don't already have that with you, I'll be prompting us to write some things down later on. And, you know, before I say any more, again, I just have to acknowledge Andreas and the translators and the whole team who is, you know, making this possible because I, I feel you all, I can feel the connection behind the computer screen of all of us joined to strengthen these loving ideas in our minds. So thank you just for making this possible, Andreas. So I am um, a part-time professor at a university. And you're going to see my professor side come out today because I've prepared a number of slides. And knowing that we are being translated into many different languages, I'm trying to rely a lot on pictures instead of words in my slides. So I'm going to just share my screen now. Can everyone see this? Yes, wonderful, okay. So I'd like to begin with just sharing a little bit um, about me because many of us are meeting for the first time and this is little me, this is me around the age, I'm guessing four, somewhere around there. And at this time, I had already had a psychiatric diagnosis of separation anxiety disorder. My mother could not leave me in a room, even in our own house, without me screaming my head off. I had very, very high anxiety, so much so that I wanted to be a ballerina so badly. I wanted to dance, but I couldn't bear the thought of being far away from my mom. So I couldn't do these dance classes because I needed her right there and it just wasn't possible to do that. So my history with anxiety has been lifelong. I was young when I started struggling with intense fear, intense anxiety. And you'll hear me talk a lot about separation anxiety today. As a child, I also grew into a lot of phobias. And when I entered university, around the age of 18, 19 years old, I started struggling with severe panic attacks. They were brought on because a student who was older than me, who I didn't know, died very suddenly of an illness on campus. The student was fine the night before and passed the next morning. And I remember feeling a rush of fear come through my body. And I was just fixated on the thought, how can a loving God create things that die? How can a loving God create things that die? And I remember feeling terrified that an illness like this could take me. So in college that night, I went to sleep. And I remember waking up at about three o'clock in the morning, feeling as though I had been punched in the stomach, having a hard time breathing. And I was in the middle of my very first panic attack. I did not know what was happening. I thought I was dying. And I climbed down my bunk bed, trying to not wake up my roommate. I grabbed our phone, our, our room phone. We did not have cell phones back then. 
I stretched the wire outside the door and I called my mom and she instilled hope that we would find help for me. And it was at this time that my mom introduced me to A Course in Miracles. Now she had previously tried to talk to me about the course, but I would put my hands over my ears and I would say, I don't wanna hear this spiritual garbage. <laughs> and that was all, I, I would not have it. And it was only once I was so desperate for relief that I became open to try anything. So this is my original Course in Miracles book on the left. It is in pieces. The cover is totally off. It was held together with duct tape for some time. And you can see here on the right, the date was January 19th, 1997. My mom wrote, dearest Corinne, amazing grace that relieves me of fear. Tis grace that finds me relieved. How precious did that grace appear on the hour that I first believed. In grace and love, mom. This book is responsible for so many things. This book is responsible for me getting off medication. This book is responsible for me having a good relationship with my parents. This book is responsible for me having a healthy marriage of 17 years to my husband. And this book is solely responsible for my healing from the multiple anxiety disorders that I used to live with. When I first read the words, nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists, herein lies the peace of God, that was my love at first sight. That was when I knew that I found my way home. So I am so grateful that we all share this path because I know how much healing this path has brought to many of us. Now I wanna pause and talk a bit about the experience of anxiety. Anxiety exists on a continuum. On the left side, we have low anxiety. We might not even think of our experience as anxiety. This is perhaps experienced as a feeling of just restlessness, a need to stay busy, maybe a subtle unease, or perhaps just an undercurrent of a lack of peace. And then we have high anxiety on the right side of the continuum. These are where the anxiety disorders fall. Panic attacks, extreme fear, and uncontrollable worry. This is where I lived a lot of my life. And I'm wondering if you could just take a moment, maybe even write this arrow on a piece of paper and just make a tick mark as to where you feel you fall on this anxiety continuum. Because we all experience a sense of anxiety, at least from time to time. Psychologists distinguish between the terms fear and anxiety. Psychologists say that fear is a response to something real and that anxiety is a response to something unreal and imagined. 
but we know as core students, it's all unreal. So I'm using the term anxiety and fear interchangeably because they come from the same place as we know. So when we find A Course in Miracles, and no matter what our issue is, maybe it's been anxiety, maybe it's been depression or conflict or scarcity, our expectations of when we find A Course in Miracles is that things are just going to improve and just get better and go straight up to healing and recovery. But this is reality down here. Our trajectory of healing can be very messy. It can be very bumpy. It can be tangled. And so just to share a little bit more of my story, in 2009, I went through another very significant debilitating episode of anxiety. And I'd already been a Course in Miracles student for 12 years, 11 years. Now hearing this, oftentimes people say, oh no, I thought we study the course so this doesn't happen again. But what comes up always is coming up because there's something that needs to be seen. There's something that needs to be uncovered. Trials are but lessons we failed to learn, presented once more. So this 2009 episode of anxiety actually felt worse than the first time I had panic attacks. And I knew enough, having had 12 years of studying the course, I knew enough that I really needed to pay attention some kind of lesson was coming through. And what I learned at this time was that I had been using A Course in Miracles as a Band-Aid. I had been turning to the course, reading something to feel better, doing my lessons, talking to the Holy Spirit, but I was still running away from the experience of anxiety. I was still trying to push away feelings of fear. I did not want to feel them. I did not want to look at them. I just wanted to feel better. And so what I realized, and this came through because I started having episodes of very intense early morning anxiety. I don't know if anybody can relate but it's the feeling when you wake up and you're just in a ball of tension and stress. And for me, anxiousness, even if I would go to bed calm, I would wake up this way. And what I realized was that, and we're going to be talking about this a lot, I needed to turn towards the anxiety and look at it with the Holy Spirit. Looking at anything can be scary, but when we realize we have the Holy Spirit with us, who's looking with us at whatever difficulty is arising, the Holy Spirit sees straight past the error to the truth beyond. So when I started turning toward the feelings of anxiety in the morning, And imagining the Holy Spirit with me, looking at the anxiety with me. Oftentimes, what would happen, just as when the sun comes out and burns away the morning fog, it was as if the Holy Spirit's light would shine away that anxiety. And I would feel my body relax, my mind quiet. And then I would choose to get out of bed. Whereas previously, I would just run out of bed trying to shake off that feeling of of anxiousness. So we will be talking more about looking with 
the Holy Spirit as we move forward, looking at our difficulties with the Holy Spirit. I am honored to have my book, From Anxiety to Love, which was published about three years ago, so far has been translated into Swedish, Mandarin, and Dutch. I am hoping that a Spanish translation will be happening soon. I'm not sure. It's, it's up to um, a Spanish publisher, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed. But my, my book details all of the lessons from A Course in Miracles, all the insights that I've gained, all many stories of healing. It brings all of this together in this work. And so it's been such an honor to be able to um, help others across the world who have been like me, who have struggled with these, these feelings. And it's won some book awards, which has been a, a, a beautiful honor. So moving on, there's some research that says that we have about 60,000 thoughts per day. And 90% of these thoughts are repetitive. They're about the same thing. We think about the same thing over and over and over and over. And I'm wondering if this sounds familiar to anyone. Why is this? Why would we have our minds filled with the same thoughts over and over again? From the perspective of A Course in Miracles, our surface level thoughts, our anxious feelings, our fearful thoughts serve a very distinct purpose. Our worry thoughts represented by these pictures, the sad face, the clock running out of time, the piggy bank for money, all of our fear thoughts, our worry thoughts are purposefully used by the ego to keep love out of our awareness. These thoughts, these repetitive thoughts, our surface thoughts are like a barrier that the ego has concocted to keep our remembrance of God out of our minds. And these thoughts can be so powerful and have such a charge that the ego hopes we will not look deeper, that we will just stay believing our surface level thoughts and not go any deeper. So this is the closed loop thought system of the ego, but thank goodness we have the Holy Spirit. Because if we don't call on the Holy Spirit, we stay in this closed loop. When we call on the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is our bridge. The Holy Spirit is that opening, that connection through which we remember the truth. We allow the love to flow to flow into our minds, for our minds to remember the truth. And it's here that we learn through the Holy Spirit that we have never separated from God, never. We are still, still connected. So another way of saying this is that the purpose of fear is to keep love out of our awareness. Every pang of fear is to keep love out. This diagram I drew, but it's based on a diagram that Robert Perry drew. And in this diagram, the circle represents our mind. And this is our point of attention, this dot. If our attention is out into the world, we can see out in the world, there are many ego hooks, many ego triggers, a lot of ego bait, a lot of situational fear-inducing 
circumstances that are there, again, to keep us from looking beyond that picture. If we point our attention in, initially, again, in the mind, as we've already said, are the fear thoughts, the doubt, the anxieties, the judgments. All of these are forms of ego bait. Ego, the ego hopes will take the bait and stay triggered and stay hooked because beneath that layer of fog is the blazing, shining love, the awareness of truth at the center. And it's this that the ego wants to keep hidden. I do have to say that we are called to be active miracle workers in the world. We are called to allow the loving impulses that want to come through us. We're called to extend those into the world. So we might be called to go into certain situations in the world to bring healing. So this doesn't mean that we shut out the world, but that we listen to guidance and do as directed. And it might mean getting involved in the world in order to bring healing and light and love. When we're connected with this love within, anxiety has no place to take hold. But if we are disconnected from the center, from the love within, that's where we experience anxiety. So it's a very important point to make that all anxiety is a form of separation anxiety from God. I've always wondered if as a small child, I feel like I was born anxious. I, the anxiety showed up more so because of some very early childhood traumas. But I've often wondered if I was very tuned in to feeling that separation from God. So we all have this. And healing this sense of separation is what A Course in Miracles is all about, obviously. And of course, there's lots of tools that can, can bring us to remember that we have not separated. I'm sure we're all familiar with lesson 136. This lesson is that sickness is a defense against the truth, but I've always found it helpful to substitute whatever my issue may be. So anxiety, is a defense against the truth. Depression is a defense against the truth. Conflict is a defense against the truth. Lack in any form is a defense against the truth. And saying this lesson this way is not to increase guilt. It's not to increase guilt. But instead, it's to bring our memory back to this diagram that all of these things, both within and without, from the ego's purpose, are being used to defend against our remembrance of love, to defend against the truth. So this has always been a very helpful reminder to me. This work, as I'm sure we all know, is about a fundamental shift in our identity. This is not about improving the small self. This is not about Corinne being better or my self-development. This is about a fundamental transition, a shift in identity from a lowercase s self, the sense of just being a body, transitioning into a capital S self identity of a recognition 
of the truth that we are not these bodies. This shift for me came experientially, not just with words. The words of the course were always very beautiful and helpful to me, but my biggest teaching moments have been through experience, through learning the truth about the capital S self because it's shown up in my experience. And what we're going to do is look at some miracle inspired practices that have been helpful to me for seasoned course students and maybe new course students. Many of these will sound familiar. We can apply these practices to anything. I am specifically talking about anxiety, but substitute whatever the issue is in anxiety's place and all of these practices will apply. And what I'm going to do is share some of these tools. And then I'd like to share a story from my own experience to tie all of the practices together to sort of see this in action. So this is where I ask that you have your, your paper and your, your pen ready. These are not necessarily in any order, although I tend to use these practices in this order. This first practice is to identify everything that you are afraid of, to write it down. This can be every fear from something little that you're concerned about that might happen today to bigger fears about health, family, money, the world. And the course has many teachings that say, be not afraid to look. So getting out all of our fears and writing it down on paper can be extremely helpful in this process of looking with the Holy Spirit at what is hiding out in our minds. So I'm going to ask right now that you do this. I call this in my book, a laundry list. It's a laundry list of all fears. And right now, please do take your pen and jot down as many fears as you can think of on your paper. So I'm going to just be quiet for a few moments while we write things down. Everything and anything that you are afraid of. It doesn't matter how little the fear or how big the fear. They're all blocks to the awareness of the truth. So let's get them out in order to prepare to look at them with Holy Spirit. And as you're doing this, just breathing, taking some deep breaths. And I'm assuming you have at least one thing on your list at this point. So I'm going to move forward, knowing that you can continue this later on if you need to. But as long as you have at least one thing written down, then that's beautiful. So let's go to the next slide. So now we're going to take radical responsibility 
I'm sorry for the sort of gruesome skull, <laughs> but as we know, A Course in Miracles teaches us that we made the world. We dreamt up time. We dreamt up death. Every fear in the mind has been created by the ego, not by God. So the Course teaches us that all of this, the entire world, death itself is a belief and it's, it's coming from our sleeping split mind. We have not left the truth. We have not left God. But the part of the mind that's sleeping and dreaming this dream, it's all coming from that part of our sleeping mind. So it is part of my practice to take radical responsibility that everything that's showing up in my experience is somehow coming from the sleeping split mind. I don't know how. I don't know quite how it works experientially, but somehow this is true. So regardless of the circumstance, regardless of who we might think is guilty for putting us in a certain position, can we still experiment with taking radical responsibility for all of it and say, somehow this is coming from my sleeping mind? And so I ask us to just look at your list right now and say to yourself, I take responsibility that somehow these fears, these situations are coming from my sleeping split mind. I take responsibility. And just feel into that. If you want to even close your eyes for a moment. And just feel yourself, even saying to yourself, I don't know how I am responsible, but I am willing to take responsibility for what I see, for everything that's showing up in my experience. So after we've taken radical responsibility, this is a prettier picture. (laughs) This is about being willing to release everything to the Holy Spirit. Now these next two slides are similar, this one and the next one, they're similar, but they're also different. In this step, I'm going to just do a quick overview of both slides and then come back to this one. This is a releasing of everything on our list to the Holy Spirit, offering it all over. This next slide, this is how I imagine looking with spirit. So I have here my tangled ball of yuckiness, (laughs) whatever the, the problems are. And I imagine Holy Spirit by my side, and we are looking at it together. And you can see just the light of the Holy Spirit shining straight through whatever that is. So it might be that you resonate with this idea of looking at your list with Holy Spirit. Or if we go backwards, you might resonate with the idea of releasing your list to the Holy Spirit. And so just check in. They're both... um, essentially doing the same thing. Maybe you want to do both. For a moment, please look at your list that you've taken radical responsibility for and either be willing to release it or look at it with Holy Spirit, whichever practice resonates with you. You might look at the list and then release it. 
and just taking a moment to do this. When you feel like you've released, when you've looked at this list with the Holy Spirit, just taking a deep breath. There's another very important point to be made, and I want to go back a slide. Radical releasing means that we don't just give over the stuff that we don't like. Radical releasing also means that we give to the Holy Spirit everything that we cherish. So you have your laundry list, but if you think for a moment of all the things that you love, all the things that you care about, family and being specific, maybe your children, parents, my husband, my pets, things that I love, the mountains, the beach, the trees, money, <laughs> everything that we love needs to be handed over to the Holy Spirit as well, not to just let it go, but for the Holy Spirit to use those things on behalf of the awakening of all. So if we're withholding certain things from the Holy Spirit, the things that we think are good, or the things that we think we can control, if we're hanging on to those things, that is the perfect setup for the ego to still take hold in those experiences. So by releasing everything to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit keeps those things safe. The Holy Spirit repurposes any specialness in those things again, into holiness, into it being a means of remembering the truth, a means of awakening. And it's important to note that there is an exchange. So we are never just releasing things to Holy Spirit and it just vanishes. It's always an exchange. We get back a miracle. We get back an experience of the truth. It might be a feeling, it might be that sh something that shows up in form, but it's always an exchange. So if you haven't already done this again, releasing your list, looking at the things on your list, and I really encourage you to just take a moment to look at these things one by one as you release and look with, you might say, Holy Spirit, I look at this with you. Now I'd like to just pause for a moment. I'm doing a little bit of a digression, but this is a very important point. This diagram is from a program that I'm involved in called the Love Lens. It's a series of 10 episodes, and they are conversations about A Course in Miracles and racism. And this diagram, this arc, all of us want to land on the freedom that forgiveness brings. We want to land here and experience that freedom. But oftentimes we overemphasize certain teachings of the Course while ignoring other teachings of the course that prompt us to look as we've been doing, as we just did with our lists. So we immediately might jump to teachings when we're experiencing something difficult or having a hard conversation, like for instance, about racism or whatever the difficulty is that you maybe wrote on your list. We might immediately want to go to these teachings of there are no bodies. 
There are no victims. There is no world. God didn't create whatever the difficulty is, so it's not real. What I thought happened didn't. These are the teachings of the Course, and they're beautiful and helpful, but they're to be experienced, not just stated in words. And to experience these teachings, we need to do the looking. We need to look with the Holy Spirit at everything that's in our mind, because we know that everything we see out there in the world is coming from the mind. And we can take that radical responsibility and then, then look. So here are just, I won't read all of these, but these are some of the teachings from A Course in Miracles that prompt us to look. This first quote says, you have nothing to lose by looking open-eyed at this. For ugliness such as this belongs not in your holy mind. Another quote says, how else can one dispel illusions except by looking at them directly without protecting them? And I'll just read one more. Do not leave any spot of pain hidden from his light and search your mind carefully for any thoughts you may fear to uncover. So as we look, this brings about a recognition of the truth of these other teachings. And we find, we land on that freedom that forgiveness brings, but we can't leave out the looking. <clears throat> so I just had to make that very important point about the importance of looking and acknowledging what is in the mind. So the next tool or practice or step is asking the Holy Spirit to see witnesses for love. This is the exchange. <clears throat> we give over to the Holy Spirit and we ask to experience the love instead, to see that witness for love, that witness for kindness. This is how the Holy Spirit repurposes what we see. We hand over what we see and there's a new way of seeing that we get instead. So I promised that I would um, share a story to tie together the practices that we just explored. This story was a very significant experience in my own development of trust. Much of my anxiety was linked to health fears. If I experienced a bodily symptom, I could go from calm to panic in a moment. And I would often run to the doctor if I felt something off, I'd, I'd run to the doctor as fast as I could because I was so scared. So this is a number of years ago. I had a physical symptom my whole life, but one day I just decided to start worrying about it. <clears throat> and I talked to my doctor and I said, you know, I have this symptom. I've always had it. And the doctor was like, well, you can investigate. And I was like, okay. So I was referred to a, um, uh, a specialist, a doctor that looks at um, blood and gross things like that. <laughs> <clears throat> so I went into this doctor's office and by the way, I'll keep the details to a minimum because um, I used to be very squeamish with blood and needles. And, and if anybody is sensitive, I, I um, I'm aware of that. So I was in this doctor's office and I was very uncomfortable, very nervous to be there. And I sat down because the nurse was going to um, do a, a, a blood draw, a lab, lab draw. 
And as the nurse was preparing my arm, she asked me why I was there. And I told her about the symptom. And she said, well, that's not good. And I was like, well, I've had the symptom my whole life. And she goes, well, that's not good. <laughs> and then she said, don't you pass out on me. So guess what I did? Her words were very triggering for me. And, you know, they had to, I had to lay down. They had to bring me juice to bring my blood sugar back up because I didn't fully pass out, but I came very close. Now I could have easily blamed that nurse for being a terrible nurse. And I'm going to, I'll continue that thread of the story in just a moment. I when I came to, I went into the doctor's office and I left with a prescription for even more lab work. And this time I had to go to a hospital to get the lab work done. Hospitals were even more triggering for me. So I was so nervous and so anxious leading up to this appointment. And I remember sitting in the car and saying to myself, and even before this, thinking about that nurse and saying to myself that rather than say she's a lousy nurse, rather than blame, I'm going to take radical responsibility. I'm going to say somehow this fear, which was already in my mind, somehow I put a signal out with that fear. The nurse agreed to play that dance with me. And it was as if I was saying, I somehow called her forth to witness to my fear. So I took radical responsibility in this situation right here. Somehow this nurse situation, this fear is coming from my split mind. And I was not afraid to look at all of my fears that were coming up. So these are all the steps sort of happening at, at the same time. This nurse, I'm taking radical responsibility. She's coming. The situation's coming from my split mind. Holy Spirit, I'm willing to give you everything. I'm willing to look at this. And what I kept saying was that I want to see and call forth witnesses for love. I want to call forth witnesses for love instead of fear. And I kept saying this leading up to this appointment. I kept saying this as I was sitting in the car, shaking because I was so terrified to go get this more extensive blood work done. So I went into the outpatient clinic at this hospital, very nervous. And I immediately met eyes with the woman working behind the desk. And she was the mom of one of my college roommates. And I immediately relaxed and it was so nice to see her. And I had forgotten that she worked there and that she was a nurse. Initially, I just thought she was maybe the receptionist. So she, without my asking, walked me into the back. She did the lab draw while we chatted the whole time about my friend, her daughter and her grandkids, my daughter's children, I'm sorry, my, my friend's children. And that wasn't even the most miraculous piece about this story. What stopped me in my tracks, you know, everything went smoothly. I did not pass out. It was totally fine. And as I was leaving, it was a Monday. She said, Corinne, it was amazing that you came in today because she said, I never, ever work on Mondays, but I got called in 30 minutes before you showed up. That to me was a witness for love. That to me was the effect of my having, take, my having taken radical responsibility for everything that is coming from my mind and being wholly willing and open to call forth witnesses for love instead of fear. This brought me, if you remember that circle diagram, 
This brought me into that quiet, still, loving center. And it showed me that we do not walk alone. We have not separated from God. And in that knowing, anxiety has to fall away. So I want to share just a couple more ideas and um, I'm not sure that we're going to I'll try to leave a couple minutes for, for questions, but um, I'm not sure that we're going to have time. I always prepare a lot because there's so much to say about this. But I just wanted to share this tool. This has been a very significant tool for me. When I shared with you all before about the early morning anxiety, I would always try to run away from it. I would try to distract myself. But I learned that I had to start to turn toward the anxiety. So this thermometer, this barometer, we can think of as no anxiety at the bottom, high anxiety at the top. Each one of us has a threshold, this dash right here. We each have a threshold of when the anxiety becomes too much when the fear becomes too much. Before it turns into being too much, when it's a little lower but tolerable, that's when we can really try to sit with the anxiety and look at it with the Holy Spirit, allow ourselves to feel it with the Holy Spirit sitting with us looking. When it's too much, when the anxiety is too high, we might need an interruption in our pattern in order to lower the anxiety. We might need to distract ourselves. And that's what this next slide is. A healthy distraction is anything that we do that's healthy, like listening to music, holding an animal, being in nature, journaling, yoga, being at the beach or getting fresh air. This is, we can do anything with the Holy Spirit. We can invite the Holy Spirit into everything that we do to help our anxiety level come down to a tolerable point of where we can look at it with the Holy Spirit. So it can help to bring the anxiety lower so we can turn towards These are just um, some suggestions of other ways that we might lower our anxiety and feel grounded, repeating our favorite Course in Miracles lessons, breathing in and out slowly, naming non-distressing things that we can see, feel, and hear, sensing our feet on the floor, even wrapping ourselves in a blanket and imagine being held by Jesus, by the Holy Spirit. I also have, um, so my book has lots of meditations in it. And I'm just going to describe this because we don't have time to actually do it. But I call this the rock meditation. And the rock meditation is about looking into the eyes of an image or another person where we can imagine that that person is seeing us with the eyes of perfect love. So just look at this baby. This baby sees your light. It sees your radiance and your truth. And just looking at this baby right now and just imagining this baby seeing your light, that immediately makes you feel uplifted. It awakens something in you. You can do this with the eyes of Jesus, any image that's meaningful for you. So I have this meditation on Spotify. It's part of the whole album. I'll put those links in the chat in just a, a moment. 
Um, this is one of the additional practices that can be so incredibly, incredibly helpful. Actually, let me just continue. I'll, I'll put the links in the chat in just a moment. Remember that healing is not about resisting anxiety. It's about remembering love. And just to recap, we can write down our laundry list of everything we're afraid of and even writing the things that we love. We can take responsibility for it all, that it's coming from our split mind. We can give it all to the Holy Spirit, look at it with the Holy Spirit. We're avoiding bypassing when we look with the Holy Spirit at what's coming up in our minds. We can ask to see witnesses for love. We can use that anxiety barometer to see if we need to distract ourselves temporarily from fear or turn toward it. And then of course, there's the rock meditation from anxiety to love, in from anxiety to love. So I do hope that we can connect. Um, this is my website, fromanxietytolove.com. I do have podcasts, a free uh, crash course, a lot of resources. And um, there aren't many minutes left. We only have a few. So I'm not sure if um, there is the option of, of taking a question in the chat, but what I am going to do is share with you the uh, <clears throat> link to the From Anxiety to Love meditation album on Spotify. And you can find the rock meditation there. I just posted that in the chat. And in addition, there are three meditations from the album that you could actually download too. And I put that link in the chat too. It's from anxietytolove.com forward slash meditations. This has been such a beautiful um, journey and I am so incredibly grateful to share this path with so many mighty companions. Um, each miracle that we accept into our minds shortens time. It releases suffering. As the Course says that a, a bird with broken wings begins to sing and a stream long dry begins to flow again. So the work that you all do, it matters. And I thank you so much for being, for being on this journey. Thank you, everyone.